Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this webinar on climate change and sustainability. My name is Colette Kane and I currently chair the Public Sector Committee within the Ulster Society. We are really delighted to welcome you here today. There's so many of you have, have opted to attend and we, I can tell you we have three excellent speakers for you today on this most important of topics. As accountants, climate change and sustainability would seem very daunting to us, or maybe that's just me. Although we have ex expert speakers today, our time is limited, but we hope to give you a flavour of the most important role we accountants will play in promoting climate change and sustainability. I will now introduce our three speakers who will give their presentations and then we'll take questions. Please place your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Our first speaker is Debbie Caldwell, who is the Climate Commissioner in Belfast City Council. Debbie comes with an impressive CV, having led the design and delivery of climate initiatives in a number of countries, including Bangladesh and Rwanda. In her presentation today, Debbie will outline how Belfast is tackling climate change. Our second speaker is Dr. Judith Wiley from the University of Ulster Business School. Judith lectures to, to students at all levels on a wide range of topics, including cybercrime, forensic accounting, risk management, and corporate governance. Today, Judith will focus her presentation on the governance arrangements required to support climate change and sustainability in organizations. Our final speaker is Keith Scott, who is Head of Climate and Business Reporting in Northern Ireland Water. Keith will highlight the climate change sorry, climate risks within Northern Ireland Water and outline the approach Northern Ireland Water take to sustainability reporting. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Debbie. Thank you. Thanks very much. Colette, that's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, to have an opportunity to kind of go through what we're doing in uh, Belfast. I'm just trying to share my screen. I hope everybody can see that at the moment. Just um, Colette, maybe you could just give me the thumbs up if you can see that, okay? Okay, I'll assume that's okay. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so Belfast declared a climate emergency in October 2019. And in, in 2020, we produced the first resilient strategy with the goal of transitioning the city to an inclusive net zero emissions, climate resilient economy in, in a generation. Back in November, apologies, I'm just trying to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, back in November, I'm sure you remember the COP26 was hosted by Glasgow City Council. And this was a fantastic opportunity for us as a council to raise awareness and build support for climate action across the city. But did it deliver the big breakthroughs we were looking for? Well, probably not. There was incremental progress in some areas. We did finalise that that Paris rule book, and that may, means that countries are gonna report detailed emissions data by 2024, and that will give us a good baseline from which uh, future reductions can be assessed. Um, the signatories also signed up to the nationally determined contributions or NDCs or targets um, by, for 2030. And there were also some promising side deals on, on forestry, coal, methane, and finance, et cetera. So where does that leave us? Well, um, quite frankly, not in a very good position. Um, this thermometer sort of shows you where we are. If you look at the green, that shows the Paris Agreement goal of limiting temperature rise to around 1.5 degrees based on the pre-industrial levels. And you can see that we're currently at 1.2 degrees. And if you look at the purple band there, that shows that if the NDC targets are fully implemented, um, that we are heading for around 2.4 degrees. But more worryingly, the dark, the dark blue bar shows you that, you know, the current policies that we have in place are, are more likely to take us to around 2.7 degrees. And this is because only a few countries are making their pledges le legally binding. So for Belfast, that means it's equally important to adapt as it is to kind of mitigate um, climate change. And I think that gets forgotten sometimes. So as a council, um, COP26, created a lot of momentum for us. Uh, Council signed up to a number of campaigns and declarations, and that means we've committed to a series of pledges around net zero and resilience. 
um, and to developing a plan to achieve these targets and then most importantly publishing our progress by reporting through the carbon disclosure project. So I just wanted to give you a kind of an indication of where we are on our journey so far as a city. Um, so we've established a governance structure across the city. The Resilience and Sustainability Board um, leads the delivery of the Re Resilience Strategy um, and it's part of this community planning partnership and it's advised by the Belfast Climate Commission, which is a partnership between the Council and Queen's University. And both the, the board and the commission include the key organisations from across the city, including Belfast Harbour, Northern Ireland Water, who are on the call today, Translink, uh, and, and so on. Um, the next important part of the puzzle really is kind of building that evidence base. So we have uh, done a, a resilience assessment and a climate risk assessment for, for the city. We have our resilient strategy, and that's currently being delivered through 30 flagship projects. Um, we have moved forward in terms of measuring our emissions and understanding which sectors they come from. And we have a net zero roadmap that sets out how we can reach 2050 by, uh, reach net zero by 2050. And we've started to track and benchmark ourselves against other cities through the Carbon Disclosure Project. Um, we've developed a retrofit delivery hub with housing exec and others to look at the housing issue because that's where more than half of our emissions are coming from. And we've been mapping climate projects and developing an investment pipeline. And we're also working with DERA, DFE, SIB and InvestNI and three other councils to develop a multi-level collaborative work plan to deliver the energy strategy and the green growth strategy at the local level. So I guess that's where we were in terms of next steps. Uh, we're planning to deliver a climate action plan with the costs and benefits quantified, a climate investment plan, and then securing development finance for a finance hub. Um, and that's really looking at developing new financial models and preparing sort of shovel ready projects for the city. And ultimately the idea is to mobilize uh, more private sector investment to create green jobs and social benefits and so on. Um, but as a city, as a, as a council, we also recognize that we need to show a bit of leadership in this area as well. So we have our own internal governance structure within the council to tackle climate change. We have an officer led uh, climate program board and we have a, a newly formed climate and resilience committee. Um, we've undertaken a sustainability review and, and we've done some baselining of our emissions. So we know where they come from. We have our new fleet strategy, which is looking at ways to reduce emissions from our fleet. Uh, we are about to start an energy review um, and look at opportunities to reduce emissions from, from our buildings. We've started with um, climate literacy training for key staff and councillors. And crucially, um, council has, has approved a £1 million climate fund. Um, and we've got a number of pilot projects identified and scoped uh, and, and ready to go. And we're also working with our suppliers to reduce emissions through the TRACE pilot programme. We have currently got three pieces of work out for tender. That's the climate risk assessment, a climate action plan and a climate investment plan. And we're also looking at putting a climate data platform together. And then importantly, securing that external finance because recognising that uh, we are going to need external finance to kind of support delivery in this area. So. Belfast currently emits around 1.5 megatons of, carb of carbon dioxide equivalent per annum, and that's about 8% of Northern Ireland's emissions. That's down from about 2.5 megatons in 2001, and that's largely come about because of the decarbonisation of the grid and the switch to wind energy. Um, the bit on the right-hand side just shows you the government's 10-point plan for green industrial revolution. You can see that all those areas highlighted in yellow are, are very relevant to, to Belfast. And you can see that cities like Belfast are gonna play a key role in, in delivering that plan. So in 2020, the Belfast Climate Commission uh, produced a carbon roadmap uh, and that charts uh, a path to net zero by 2050. And, and what they did was they worked out what Belfast share based on its population of the global carbon budget between 2020 and 2050. Uh, we would have if we were to limit global temperature rise to that, that Paris Agreement at 1.5 degrees um, of, of global warming. 
and that was calculated at 14 megatons. So if we look at the fact that we're using one and a half megatons per year, we're going to have used our carbon budget up by 2030. So you can see there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and although we've brought our emissions down a lot since 2000, we're going to have to cut them by 80% by, by 2030. So a lot of the heavy lifting has to be done in the next, in the next decade. Um, most of our emissions are coming from our buildings, um, and that's because of our aging housing stock. We've got 20%, 21% from transport and 15% from industry. Uh, in 2019, we spent nearly 300 million pounds as a city on our, on our energy needs, and that's forecast to grow to about half a billion by 2050. Um, and what the roadmap shows is, is that there is a really, really compelling case uh, for the climate action in Belfast, investing 180 million uh, per year through to 2030 would reduce our energy bills by 264 million pounds per annum. So there is a strong economic case for doing that, and that will create jobs um, and have lots of um, social benefits as well. So as I said, nearly half our emissions are coming from the domestic housing sector. We've got really high dependency on oil and gas to eat, eat our houses. We've got 100,000 homes across the city. Housing stock tends to be quite old. A lot of it is in quite poor condition. Um, the costs are really eye-watering uh, and we do need private sector finance to kind of um, to, to solve this problem. Um, you can see that we need 1.5 billion pounds of investment um, to, to retrofit our homes through lighting upgrades, double glazing and so, and so on. And although we've got a really strong economic case for retrofitting to be more, uh, so that our homes are more, energy efficient it's that upfront cost that is a huge barrier. Uh, we are working with the housing exec and the place based climate action network and others like the Climate Investment Commission to try and identify and pilot new um, financial models to kickstart this process. For example, one idea is to borrow on the capital markets and use the savings from reduced energy bills as a revenue stream to pay back the loan to finance this on a street by street basis. Uh, we, the housing exec are piloting a series of retrofit models and they're rolling this out um, to 2,000 homes across the province. And in the process of this, they're developing um, supply chain capacity, which is great. And we see this early investment as, as a real opportunity to scale out a successful retrofit model from the social housing sector to privately owned homes. And we also have a number of tertiary colleges and universities that are actively engaged in, in supporting this through a retrofit academy as well. Just touching on transport briefly, um, you know, as, as the biggest city in Northern Ireland, um, there's a huge amount of commuters coming in every day. Our population swells by 25%. During the daytime, we're among the top 25 congested cities index. 68% of journeys are single occupancy. So we have a really, really high car dependency and policies have tended to favor road building and car use over investment in public transport and active travel. So what we've ended up with is very oversized and complicated road infrastructure and that's a real barrier to active travel. So decarbonizing transport has to focus on getting us out of our cars and that means making the city center a better place to, to live so we reduce the commute changing the centre of Belfast to prioritise walking, cycling, public transport. And we're calling this the, the Boulder Vision because it involves completely reimagining the city centre. And this involves new ways of working and partnerships between local and central government. At the same time, there's a huge opportunity to transition the bus and rail system to electric and hydrogen. Um, and through TransLink, um, we've got a real opportunity there because we have a single provider, so we can avoid this fragmented approach. Um, and then also via the grid, we've got this abundant supply of wind energy, which can support the electrification of the public transport system. Um, so the scale of investment is huge, but the opportunity um, is also there. And we need to capitalise on the capabilities that we have in green transport with great companies like Artemis, Right bus, TransLink, etc. And then just touching very briefly on, on adaptation, we're a coastal city, so we're really vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The sea level and flooding and extreme heat are the biggest sort of expected impacts. 
So we need to get that balance right between adaptation and, and mitigation, and that is recognising that we are currently heading for 2.7 um, degrees of warming by the end of the end of the century. So our next steps really are to focus on doing a climate action plan for Belfast and the council and building that pipeline of net zero aligned investments so that we can mobilize um, private capital into climate projects in, in Belfast. So finally, uh, last slide here is just, you know, we do have this funding gap, public sector just can't deliver the volume of funds that we need to deliver net zero. So we need new funding um, models. We do need to make sure that that public sector funding is used in a catalytic way so that it leverages private sector investment um, so we can deliver a pace and that scale. Um, and we do need earmarked funding to support the pipeline development, hopefully through a project preparation facility, for example. And there is scope to increase collaboration between the city authorities and the finance institutes i think there's a big role there um, so and we do need to build these alliances between central and, and local government and, and data will be critical um, one thing i heard when i took this job on was that you know you use data to hold their feet to the fire um, and i think that's that's really important so thanks very much for your time i hope i haven't run over and i've been asked to um, pass you across now to dr judith wiley uh, from Ulster University. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Debbie. So hopefully you're you're seeing my my slides as well and uh, and myself. So um thanks everyone. Um my name's Judith and I um I lecture on um governance, risk and, and boredom effectiveness and I also research in the whole area of CSR, ESG, sustainability, whatever um, sort of aspect of the, the sort of alphabet soup around this you want to kind of use with it all. So it's, it's a topic that's very close to my heart and I'm delighted to be a member of the Chartered Accountants Ireland Sustainability um, Working Group, which has over the last, um, the last while developed a range of tools, resources and a sustainability hub um, and has been engaging in um, policy engagement in this area and representing accountants, for example, um, at COP26. So um, Debbie sort of was, was highlighting the importance of that and kind of focusing attention on, on climate issues and how leadership can, can take action on this. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about um, as part of the session today. So when we think about um, sustainable governance, you know, sometimes we go back to this, um, this triple bottom line. So, you know, whether it's public or private, sector you know we we have an economic responsibility and um, we also have a, a social responsibility to the people that we employ and, and we work with and and the, the societies that we we kind of locate within and we also then have a responsibility to the planet itself and in that nexus sits um sustainability and sustainable decision making but um this sort of the triple bottom line or the three p's is getting on for 30 years old now and um climate is a, is a new and very dynamic disruptor and that requires maybe um a fourth p which a lot of boardrooms are considering at the moment which is your purpose so that involves a lot of asking why we do what we do um and anybody that's kind of that likes their ted talks is a really good simon sinek ted talk on on asking why um and in a sort of leadership role asking why you're doing what you're doing and we're seeing a lot of boardrooms at the minute taking time out or hopefully post pandemic or you know emergent sort of phase from the pandemic and really it's a time to kind of take a deep breath and, and think about resilience um, and it was interesting to see debbie talking there about you know belfast city and it's it's res resilience strategy um, and it's such a key sort of aspect of overall organizational purpose uh, and leadership as as well and um, so thinking about purpose that obviously links to sustainable decision making um and and sort of that that question of why you know is asked first and then you can ask the sort of the how questions and what i'm going to hopefully deal with in the next sort of 10 minutes is the the how of, of integrating sustainability and and climate change um responsibilities into corporate decision making 
And the World Economic Forum kind of looks at it as this little puzzle of eight kind of governance pieces, if you like. You know, and as with anything complex, anything that's um, that's kind of um, new and, and requires focus, um, all of these are, are very much interrelated and, and interdependent on one another. Um, so the first is really accountability. So many of us in this call, um, self-included, are, are chartered accountants, and we are really well placed at the heart of um, at the heart of business, and really well skilled in reporting in, in sort of business processes, business strategy, to really consider. Um, this accountability piece. So in terms of climate, and Debbie highlighted, you know, some of the, the, the emergent themes in terms of um, temperature rises and how much of a climate emergency we're in. Um, so we need to understand as an individual organization, who are we accountable to and on what? Um, and, you know, that requires us thinking about our voluntary disclosures and what we talk about on a voluntary basis and how we communicate that, um, as well as an increasing landscape of, um, you know, non financial disclosures and um, directives on um, sustainability reporting and, you know, probably within the next year to 18 months, um, the, the operation of the International um, Sustainability Standards Boards and what that means um, in terms of accountability. And even as an organization, also University, um, you know, we're a big public sector organization. You're talking 25,000 students, two and a half thousand staff across four campuses. You know, we have um, we have to be accountable for um, our carbon output across those campuses and really how we're embedding sustainable thinking and action um, right across our leadership, across um, all aspects of what we do within the organization. Um, and that includes outputs and accountability like our carbon management plans as well. And in order for a boardroom to start and, and integrate this, um, these issues into decision making, you need to have a good subject command. And that's obviously why everyone's joined this session today. Um, we're kind of tooling up and, and getting down with the lingo and the resources that are available. And as I say, um, there's loads of information out there. Sometimes it's nearly like a, an information overload, but there's a great um, sustainability portal through Chartered Accountants Ireland with a range of resources to, to kind of um, look up and, and kind of start and work through, including a, a carbon reporting 10 minute um, sort of training interactive session, which, you know, 10 minutes, we can all sort of take a look at that in terms of carbon. Um, and there are also um, lots of organisations such as Business in the Community, Northern Ireland, um, that are very open to, to engaging with, with all sectors and all organisations to help um, training and, um, and development and really creating within boardrooms and leadership teams this robust awareness and understanding of, of climate issues uh, and embedding sustainability. Um, and certainly the future is bright. So um, all of our, our students at Ulster University, um, particularly on programmes like the accountancy um, graduates coming out, you know, it's been fully embedded within the accounting syllabus and indeed at the professional level as well within FAE. So the guys that are coming through are well um, clued in with um, considering this aspect of, of reporting as well. You don't uh, go too long within a governance talk without thinking about board structures and um, no matter your organization so you know obviously public sector this is the the format of the tesco's board um, which has a, its own sort of subcommittee of the boardroom um, specifically set up to to feed in and to to lead in on um sustainability issues um, but for many public or sorry private sector public sector organizations you know it might be a working group it might be you know for the university itself it's a steering group which kind of coordinates efforts right across um, the organization and we have a sustainability manager which coordinates um the the sort of the reporting and the dissemination of of activities uh, and um coordinates the the reporting as well and, you know, we've seen CFOs, CTOs, technology officers, and um, there's an increase um, in organizations employing people within um, corporate sustainability officer roles as well, sort of taking ownership and leadership and really championing um, integrating sustainability into decision making. And it's so important um, that leadership are really seen to be walking the talk as such um, in terms of carbon neutrality and sustainable decision making. 
The next um, sort of piece of the puzzle or aspect, I suppose, in terms of, of governance um, is an important one and it actually combines two of those puzzle pieces together because they do go hand in hand. Um, and if you're looking to sort of what any sustainability um, standards might look like in the future, it's likely that they're going to require materiality assessments and reporting as a board, as a leadership team on how you're managing um, through um, management systems and through risk management, your uh, climate risk and your sustainability integration. So, you know, it's like any risk, you know, it's very simple. It's, you know, what's the likelihood of this risk happening and what's the impact? And, you know, as Debbie said, you know, the, the impacts are very, very clearly seen, particularly in terms of climate change. Um, and, you know, we're, we're all familiar within organizations of the importance of risk management and, you know, the principles of, of any risk management system apply to climate risk. It's all about identifying, monitoring um, and mitigating those risks as much as possible. Um, but an important aspect of climate risk is the, the upside or the opportunity risk um, of climate and of integrating sustainability because it can lead to great innovation, great um, sort of strategic changes in, in terms of ways of doing things and ways of working, as well as the, the obvious downside risks in terms of environmental impact um, that we need to take ownership of and, you know, take, um, you know, time to, to plan scenarios. Um, and this can be challenging for many boards because it's beyond your normal sort of budgeting timeframes, you know, um, as, as you know, we've seen already through a lot of the, the COP26, you're looking at um, targets in, you know, 2030, 2050 and so on. Um, so that can sometimes challenge um, boardrooms and, and decision making on, on climate risk. But as we all know, one way to focus attention is incentivization. Um, and um, these issues are no different um, in terms of what gets measured gets done and you know and, and certainly in terms of private sector we've seen in recent years nearly sort of half of FTSE 100 companies integrating ESG measures environmental social and governance measures in their executive pay and it's believed that that links through to long-term sustainable um, performance and um, sort of really good health and resilience within organizations as well as that bottom line and um, so you see obviously like the shells and the bps and um, do so via um, carbon targets and um, the likes of apple it's more based around their, their core values their apple values as to how they want their executives behaving and working and um, so that can flex their pay sort of plus or minus 10 percent so again you know thinking about um, how you focus decision making and, and incentivize and I know Keith's going to talk uh, more about reporting and disclosures, and it's an important aspect of, of this puzzle of, of governance and sustainability. And um, within the university, we use the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as you can see here. Um, they're very visual. They are global goals, um, and it's something that you know people are are learning about right from from primary school. You know, we've done a range of resources. I've presented to to secondary schools on this right through to our own students and indeed um, our own staff and researchers uh, and business leaders um, under each of these um, under each of these goals okay so what, what we're working towards and um, there's also um, reporting standards in terms of the global reporting initiative and um, the university's just received its ISO um, accreditation in terms of sustainability reporting um, and this feeds into to a number of awards that we've recently won so it is this, again, it comes down to this sort of, uh, you know, the voluntary nature of a lot of these disclosures um, and, you know, making sure that it's, it's a good fit for your organisation and that you're not just talking about something um, for the sake of it, that it has um, real meaning and, and impact. And the final puzzle piece is uh, arguably the most important, which is exchange. OK, so, you know, obviously we're on a, a webinar today and hopefully we'll get time at the end. For discussion but I would encourage everyone to um, share their experiences on their, their journey to, to net zero um, look again at some of the resources online and you know see what other organizations are doing um, and take ideas from that um, but more importantly build relationships across stakeholder groups 
you know, this, uh, the, the sustainability agenda and, you know, innovations around climate change can really open up conversations um, with stakeholders. And you know, my own research has found that when you do this, there's big benefits in terms of innovations, improved strategy, um, and indeed the ability to kind of attract and retain and motivate talent you know, if you get that purpose piece right. Um, so on that note, um, sort of to, to hear more and to exchange more ideas, I'm delighted to hand over to Keith to hear. Um, he's going to share some of, of NI Waters um, reporting initiatives and, and innovations there. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Edith. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so just really to give you a bit of a perspective uh, from the preparer side, um, and it's really, I suppose, uh, looking at a, um, uh, a large group um, of uh, limited companies um, operating in the utility sector. So I'll briefly just run through some of the sustainability reporting challenges, um, and I'll start off just in relation to climate reporting. Um, so, um, most areas of the UK economy by 2025 will have transitioned across to a new framework of mandatory climate reporting called the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, abbreviated to TCFD. And really, what that asks us, uh, preparers to do is to basically look across the value chain um, and uh, to identify the, the climate risks um, and also the climate um, opportunities. So this is really a value chain for a standard uh, water company. Um, you don't need to, to sort of read through everything there, but you can see um, you know, there's exposures across um, the whole value chain. And generally, we, we try and group these sort of climate uh, risks into three categories. Um, on the downside, you've got the adverse weather impact called physical risks um, from climate change. Um, decarbonizing an organization or a business, uh, we refer to as traditional risks. Uh, and then on the, the upside, uh, 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 on the opportunity side, then there's a range of risks. So, so for us, physical risks, uh, looking at flooding, uh, damage uh, to infrastructure, uh, pollution. Um, uh, traditional risks are primarily you were right carbon intensive business, a lot of concrete, chemicals, um, energy, steel, aluminium, very carbon intensive products. So we're exposed to future carbon taxes and also the green premium. Um, in, in lower carbon uh, technology. And then on the opportunity side, uh, we've got uh, a lot of great opportunities, particularly around renewables, which, which I'll touch on. So you're thinking about TCFD, there's really four bits to think about. Um, uh, and as probably sort of uh, Debbie and Judith have, have touched on, it, 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 it's really sort of working out the governance, you know, it, uh, is it a board matter, audit committee matter, risk committee matter, how does your executive director sort of form around it, what subgroups do you need underneath that, looking at, you know, the climate strategy, your climate route map to net zero, how you're going to adapt and sort of mitigate climate change, and then fleshing out all the, the risk exposures across the value chain, um, and, and then also as Judith was picking up on in terms of actually metrics uh, and targets. Um, so really, for, for large private companies, uh, the threshold's really uh, to the grid in 500 employees and over 500 million turnover. Uh, that, that's where they, uh, it really kicks in, uh, and, and it becomes mandatory from 23-24. Uh, so really, what, uh, the, where the, the pressure is really on for companies is to really tie together those ambitions around, um, you know, getting to net zero, building in climate resilience, um, and actually linking them through to the financial statements and those key material assumptions um, that, that you have to make. So it's really taking your transitional risks, uh, your physical risks and your opportunities uh, and, and linking them through to the impacts in terms of, you know, your income statement, uh, your cash flow and, and your balance sheet. And I mentioned there, transitional risks, probably the big ones for us um, as a carbon intensive business are probably future carbon taxes and the green premium uh, and lower carbon technology. Physical risks, um, acute risks that are happening now, are obviously uh, exposure to, to flood, uh, drier, warmer weather in, in the winters. Um, 
chronic longer term conditions as the climate changes will probably have less sort of freezing events and more exposure to, to floods and to drier summers. On the opportunity side, that's probably all the, the opportunities around uh, building a green economy and, and we'll touch on that in, in relation to renewables. So we've been doing some work really to try and flesh out, well, how do we link the risks to the financial statements? I've been working with uh, partners at Marsh and at Judge Business School at Cambridge University to effectively develop a model. And really what this model is, it takes those risks across the value chain, whether it be traditional risks, um, physical risks, and it runs them through the various pathways uh, that Debbie was talking about. Um, uh, so we'll run it through about five climate warming pathways. And then the next stage is to sort of develop a digital twin uh, of the business. Um, that looks at your financials, uh, key facilities, you know, your carbon emissions, market supply chain. And it really shocks that digital twin to work out the financial impacts on a short-term basis, maybe the next five years, and then maybe through to a more longer term, 20 to 50 year planning horizon. And that then links through into the disclosures um, that are required under the uh, TCFD framework. And generally for most organizations, you tend to get this type of um, uh, financial exposure um, over the next couple of decades. You probably see the, the, on the transition side, the exposure to, to future climate, um, uh, carbon taxes, and the green premium and new technology kicks in probably over the next two decades. The models then start to deviate probably post 2040 and that, that's where sort of the physical risk exposure starts to overtake the, uh, the transitional risk exposure. And in terms of those uh, disclosures around transitional risks, um, generally what we have to do is convert all the, the greenhouse gas emissions into uh, you know, like a common currency um, or what's called the carbon dioxide equivalent. So you take all those different gases and they all have different weights, the likes of say um, methane and uh, nitrous oxide are obviously much greater weight than just carbon dioxide. You have to put them in a common currency, uh, a tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Then you have to sort of stick them in various buckets. So you have to stick them in, these buckets are called scope one, two, and three. Um, and really to get to net zero, you basically have to add scope one plus scope two plus scope three take off any avoided emissions from renewables or storage and land. And that basically has to equal zero. That's how you get to net zero. Your scope one, uh, all your scope one stuff is basically everything under your direct control. Uh, scope two is basically how your electricity is generated. Uh, scope three is all your supply chain stuff. So for us, um, probably half our footprint sits in scope one and two. Uh, the other half probably sits in scope three. So basically, you know, all the, 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 the sort of carbon intensive construction materials probably sit in, in scope three. And then you knock off any avoided emissions from renewable schemes or, or, or storage uh, on land. And a bit like financial budgeting then, what you do is to sort of set out, you know, how you're going to do your carbon budget, how you're going to start from your current emissions and effectively knock out those big chunks of carbon. Uh, to hit net zero by, you know, say whatever your target date is, say 2050. And this is just an example here from another water company, uh, just showing, you know, sort of the, uh, the areas they're focusing on, uh, just to sort of try and drive out uh, uh, sort of carbon from the business. And again, they're just looking at scope one and two, scope three, the real challenge, because at the minute organizations are struggling to map their supply chains to work out where things are produced, manufactured, and also the, the exposure from adverse weather events to the supply chain. Similar exposures on the, on the physical risk side of things. Um, and again, you know, you're looking at your baseline exposure, your exposure by 2050, your exposure by 2100, 2100, and that basically just get worse the longer out you look. And that sort of ties back to that, that graph um, that we're talking about where they, the physical risks really kick, uh, sort of start to kick off uh, post 2040. So a little bit about the, the work that any water is doing to get to net zero. Like all organizations, you know, you try and sort of build it into your strategy. So we have five areas in the strategy, one of which is nature, and we sort of house the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the net zero uh, carbon ambition uh, within that. Um, a carbon footprint at the minute, just looking at operational carbon, is primarily about three quarters is, is, is mixed electricity. Water is very heavy to, to pump and move about. Um, and we've other emissions then on, on, in relation to wastewater process emissions. So we have been reducing that uh, operational carbon footprint, um, but again, you know, on a total carbon level, the other half of the problem sits in the supply chain. 
so there's no one route to net zero and i suppose they, they, these are sort of some of the routes that we're looking at at the minute and, and you can sort of if you like categorize them into three three areas uh reduction renewables and, and removing carbon and uh i just want to maybe pick up on uh maybe three of those areas within each of the three categories uh just in the next slides and I, th I think the other point to make is when, whenever you're looking at TCFD, it naturally, I think, uh, takes you on to nature-related financial disclosures, uh, which are starting to sort of evolve and emerge. Uh, and they're, they're called the, the, the task force and nature-related financial disclosures. So you generally sort of, if you do one in terms of TCFD, it, it, it tends to do the other. So in terms of reducing carbon, this is an example um, of a wastewater treatment works that has um, very little uh, concrete, very little chemicals, very little energy. Um, it's effectively using a series of reed beds or ponds to, to, to use a, a nature-based solution to treat wastewater. So much, much lower carbon footprint. So that's an example of reducing carbon footprint. And also then you, you, you nature-related benefits there in terms of biodiversity, et cetera. In terms of removing carbon, um, you see here, just uh, this is uh, one of our water catchments. So behind my colleague is our raw material sitting in that big pool of water and uh, because of the runoff uh, from poor land management it's 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 basically a poor raw material we have to spend a lot of chemicals and, and energy to, to basically convert it to drinking water so again this scheme is really looking to, to take away the forests re-wet the peat bogs and, and really stimulate all those ecosystem services so we get a much better raw material but you have the added benefits in terms of biodiversity and, and carbon storage um, as well this then naturally, I think, leads you into, if you like, uh, a bit the way you do for physical assets, uh, doing a, if you like, a natural capital balance sheet. Uh, and just like your physical assets, you start off with looking at the physical aspects, um, you know, what, how, how much of, of, you know, how much coverage after your trees, peat bog soils, what's the quality like. Then you're looking into the ecosystem services from those and then monetizing those and then building those into your decision making, basically monetizing uh, those into your, your net present value calculations. So you're really trying to capture what's not captured in the market at the minute in terms of those wider environmental and social costs and benefits. And this is an example uh, just on the Antrim Plateau. And again, it's looking at one of our peat bogs there. And just to sort of highlight, you know, whenever we started to look at those wider um, uh, environmental and social costs and benefits, you are getting, in this case, uh, you know, a times for return on investment. And then this naturally, I think, then leads you into multi capitals or maybe six capitals uh, reporting. And just to highlight um, some work that's been done by um, another water company, Yorkshire Water. And it's probably the best six capitals decision making and reporting that I've came across, uh, certainly within the utility sector and probably wider. And it's just really uh, an example of how you look beyond the traditional financial capital and manufactured capital and look across natural capital, human capital, intellectual capital, social capital. And Yorkshire Water have uh, published their methodology. So you can just jump on their site and have a look at it. But it's really just to show how their value chain generates uh, sustainable uh, increases in, in, in all the capitals, not just one um, in, in, uh, to this benefit of another. And uh, as, as Judith mentions, then um, we are starting to see some of the, the early prototypes published for uh, the IFRS uh, sustainability standards. So really, you know, we're trying to put sustainability reporting on par with financial reporting. Um, and again, if you look at some of the prototypes that, that you know, I, th I think if you are going down the TCFD, TNFD route, I think you're, you're naturally going to tick a lot of the boxes uh, in relation to the sustainability standards. Lastly, then, just on the opportunity side, um, we are having a little think about how we can use our, our infrastructure uh, to help, uh, if you like, not just uh, any water uh, transition to net zero, but also to help wider society transition. And we've, uh, uh, we've assets all across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, they're all electricity connected. Um, so effectively we can flex our assets as, as the biggest user of electricity uh, to help manage the, the, the supply demand balance whenever we bring more renewables onto the electricity grid. Uh, we're looking at battery storage to help balance that supply and demand. So whenever we have a lot of wind, a lot of solar, but no 
low demand, say at night for, for, for wind, uh, we can store that and then release it during the day whenever there's more demand. We're also looking at redundant assets in terms of redundant reservoirs uh, to maybe to fill them at night and then release them during the day um, and sort of take advantage of the price differential uh, in terms of electricity prices, obviously cheaper at night uh, and more expensive during the day whenever there's more demand. Uh, and we're the first water company in UK and Ireland to be looking to produce green hydrogen from wastewater uh, using a process called electrolysis. So it basically splits H2O into hydrogen, uh, which we can use as a fuel, not just for our assets, but also to power heavy goods vehicles and oxygen, which gives us a lot more capacity in a wastewater treatment works. And obviously uh, a lot of uh, economic development constraints at the minute due to lack of wastewater capacity. So we see that um, as a plus there. So again, that's a little uh, insight into the opportunity side um, as well. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, all the speakers, Judith and Debbie. And it was fascinating, really, and, and all from different aspects. I think that was what impressed me. Um, and, you know, there's lots of things I was making notes here uh, as you went along. So thank you very much for, for um, showing all the different, um, different things that are going on in this world. Um, can I encourage everyone to put questions in, please? We have a question. Um, let's just see. Yeah, some, somebody just commented there about uh, Northern Ireland Water's uh, innovation on the hydrogen and oxygen. Um, yeah, fascinating indeed. Um, so question for Debbie. Um, Debbie, did Belfast City Council develop its own calculator for greenhouse gas emissions um, or use an off-the-shelf product? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We, we actually use ABC Energy to do our baseline emissions. So we're in, like many organizations, just in the process of building up our kind of team and our capacity. Um, so we are going to, we are in the process of hiring and internalizing that um, to the organization. But this year we've, uh, we've outsourced that to Apsi Energy and they do this for quite a lot of councils and schools and organizations that have a standard methodology. So we've used them, they've set our trajectory and they're doing an energy review for us as well. Uh, and do they do that, um, Judith, specifically for Belfast City Council, or is it based on um, a, a normal council or whatever? Or... Yeah, they take all the, so we give them all the energy data, all the utilities information and energy usage data for all of our buildings, what hundreds of buildings. And then um, for our fleet, it's like a breakdown uh, by vehicle model and type and mileage. Um, and then they look at our kind of uh, scope three emissions where we've got the data for our supply chain. So that's like Keith saying, that is the toughest one to crack, really your scope three emissions. But that is where you can have the biggest impact because a, a normal organization has like 70 percent of the footprint is actually through your supply chain. Mm -hmm. So if we all started measuring our scope three emissions and working with our suppliers we that's that's the way we can actually kind of accelerate the transition by incentivizing our suppliers to, to sort of go more green than they are yes keith you mentioned that as well about the um supply chain and i think you said it was something like 50 percent uh, contribution something like that um how, how do you go about encouraging your supply chain then to to help you to achieve your targets yeah, I think it's a big challenge, a big challenge for us because there isn't a, a substitute co uh, concrete at the minute and concrete is the most carbon intensive um, product that, that, that's been developed. Um, so we are starting to see now, the Department of Finance has started to ask um, uh, that uh, whenever we go out to tender in, in, in the public sector, that we start to look at social value uh, and part of that scoring uh, will include uh, suppliers' carbon management plans. Um, so there's, there's a 10% score um, to start with, and I think that will ratchet up then to 20% and then higher. So I think that's probably the one of the ways, I think, in which, although the large bits of the economy are going to transition, I think that will naturally drive SMEs um, uh, as well. Um, 
So, but I think the challenge is, you know, not, not all um, organizations have maybe the, the resources to sort of dedicate to this, to sort of work out the carbon footprint of their, you know, products and services, to develop, you know, carbon plans. So I, I think, uh, you know, trade associations, trade bodies, I think, are a good route to develop um, and share, you know, tools to sort of support um, SMEs uh, on, on that area. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I suppose you, um, through your work, you're working with the water companies across the, the in England, Wales, um, to do that as well. Yeah, we, we do find. I mean, the, the we do find that there is a standard uh, carbon counting workbook for for the water sector, uh, and it, it certainly does help. Although, it really only covers scope one and two emissions at the minute, and the big challenge is scope three, basically the supply chains. So, uh, so um, you know, it is being developed, but it does help standardise the the approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question, and maybe Judith, if you would kick off with this one, um, it's about um, whether you think auditors will be required to offer an opinion on the environmental disclosures in the financial statements. Yeah, so it's a good question, and it's an important question. So there are organisations at the moment, particularly those, um, I suppose, more private sector firms that are producing standalone reports. Um, that will actually have assurance over those um, reports so they'll bring in um, organizations to, to do that um, with the move to, to the standards um, over the next sort of year 18 months yes it's anticipated that that will be a, an, um, an audit requirement to, to have that assurance and that audit of, of those non-financial disclosures as well um, so that is something that's that's um, going, only going to increase and come down the line. So again, whether that's from a specialist perspective um, or from from your, you know, and that will likely, you know, in the future could form part of your audit team. It will not just be your, you know, your accounting specialists. It'll be, you know, people that will feed in maybe on the, the carbon side as well and, and incorporate that sort of um, body of experts in the, the audit and assurance process. Yeah, it strikes me that it's it's very specialised, and uh, you know certainly um, us and you know as as an auditor, I would it would certainly wreck my head in terms of trying to get, <laughs> to get some. But yeah, I can imagine there will be people who will be expert in, in that type of thing that um, you could fade mm -hmm. into the process. Yeah. Okay. Um. This is for um. It's um. I'm gonna just read it out here. Um. For any of the speakers, it says, do you think we are well positioned to make progress in terms of climate action, even though we are behind the curve in terms of um, being the only country in Europe without climate legislation? Can business business and the private sector lead on this front in the absence of um, Stormont, I presume that says, demonstrating real leadership? So, yeah, obviously we, we have some... Um, legislation that was being debated there recently but um it, you know certainly it sounds like from the three speakers today that you're doing this <laughs> anyway you know you're trying to progress this as best you can um so let's see now um maybe debbie as 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 a new person coming to northern ireland and <laughs> taking up the mantle here maybe you would have some comment on that as to how we can progress this in the absence of the legislation well, I think that point about business is really important because I think the I think businesses are leading the way. You see um, companies like um, Northern Ireland Water and TransLink showing kind of huge leadership in this area. So I think you know the public sector's doing its bit as well, but it's 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 not as nimble as as the private sector. So um, I think it's harder without the legislation and, and the concrete targets but you know there's still a lot a lot we can do and you can see the power of of policies and you know when when you see the government legislating around electric vehicle usage and the powerful signal that has sent to the market and the massive uptake in electric vehicles across the UK this year has been 11 percent I think of all vehicles sold so the climate legislation is a key is a key driver, um, but we do have some really positive policy sort of developments with the green growth strategy and the energy strategy, uh, and then um, DFE came out of the blocks really quickly. You know they only published that strategy in December, and then in January they followed up with their their 22 actions for 2022. Um, so that's really positive to see that they are moving so fast and, and they're making uh, funding available to incentivize that change. And it is that kind of earmarked 
kind of public development finance that's really really important to kind of de-risk some of the kind of trickier kind of uh, challenges that we've got so I think I think we can move forward I certainly hope to see the climate legislation coming through quite quickly hopefully this year yeah. um, but if not we'll still be we'll still be kind of working on it <laughs> keeping going <laughs> um Judith just on um the, uh, some of the stuff you talked about was around the, the governance and the board's role in, in this. Yeah. I mean, with everything else uh, that's going on, I imagine a lot of boards are focused on, you know, COVID recovery and getting back to where they, they want to be. I mean, is this a priority for them or how do we make it a priority for boards? I think, yeah, it is. It's a good question, Claire. Uh, you know, it's uh, there, there's so much to, to manage and to factor in, but I think it comes down to that interconnectedness of everything, you know, that, that um, if you think about pandemic recovery and, and so much of what we've learned over the last sort of 18 months, two years, you know, it is, it is, does come back to sustainability and, and, um, and, and climate and, and our globalized kind of economies and ways of working. So I think it is a chance with, you know, everything has been disrupted and now we're thinking about, you know, what do we, do in terms of going back to the workplaces and things like this mm -hmm. so I think it is a good opportunity to start and really embed and, and really build resilience and build strategy so I think you know we, you can't have boardroom decision making at the moment that doesn't doesn't incorporate this you know and again like the legislation and you know some of the you know the compliance that, that's coming around this will obviously focus attention but um as we we're saying there's so much of it is voluntary mm -hmm. and you know to feed off what debbie was saying you know on the legislative side you know great if, if the legislation comes through soon and that'll set targets and and get commissioners in place and things like that but you know to me northern ireland we're brilliant at, at innovation you know look at, at the at about about the hydrogen you know we're, we're great with coming up with with innovations and ideas um particularly around these these sorts of initiatives so i think you know public and private sector is is really well placed to to just get going and, and roll the sleeves up and, and really lead the way um with, with the underpinnings of the assurance and the legislation and the you know the reporting um disclosure initiatives and, and so on but you know i think on a voluntary basis you know it's 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 a strategic priority and it, it you know it is and it and it should be yeah um let's hope it is um so just a final question then um keith um where would you find good sources of guidance for sustainability um reporting i think a lot of people on this call are probably thinking down the line to their annual report and accounts and on how we, we we do the best job we can to report on things yeah well i was wondering the, the financial reporting council um it's probably great uh, source there, so they published a climate thematic review uh, on sort of best practice corporate reporting. Um, the FRC lab is also looking at um, ESG data disclosures as well. Um, and then on, on the HM Treasury site, uh, they, they've, they've also updated their um, sort of annual sustainability reporting guidance. So uh, there's, there's plenty of material there, uh, but those would be probably the uh, two good starting points. Okay. And um, Judith, from your point of view on that, just um, with being involved with Chartered Accountants Ireland, um, do they uh, flag up any good examples there of good sustainability reporting from Irish companies at all? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's a really good starting point, you know, is that piece on, you know, what are others doing in similar sectors and similar similar organisations and, and kind of here you know because the the hard measurements if you want to call it that around carbon and everything that that can come and you can you can seek guidance and support on that but um it's, it comes down to that you know where do you want to to be what what do you want to be about uh, and that purpose piece that that really is that you know what boardrooms are, are kind of there to, to set that leadership tone um so that you know a good starting point on that is conversations it's looking at the examples that are available on the the chartered accountants ireland mm -hmm. um sustainability hub uh, and kind of get getting getting conversations going within yeah. the boardroom mm -hmm. and beyond on on uh, sharing ideas Okay, thank you so much. I think we've just about had the time, um, surprisingly enough. And thank you so much for keeping um, to the, the uh, allocated time. All three of you were, were fantastic at that. Um, I think it's been really good. I've certainly enjoyed and learned lots. And, um, you know, I think it's it's maybe there's probably more conversations to ha to come, actually. And I wouldn't be surprised if we, we schedule in another maybe a longer uh, um, session on, on particular aspects of what you've talked about today. So again, thank you so much from, from the Ulster Society. 
Um, and just uh, anyone still online, just a little plug for an event on the um, 3rd of March, um, which is on diversity and inclusion. And it features a number of excellent speakers, including from the public sector, Siobhan McKenna, who is head of equality, diver diversity and inclusion at the um, public accounts, um, appointment service. So um, if any of you are interested in that, please sign up for it. Um, I'd say that would be a really, really interesting. Another aspect of, of responsibility, which of course we, we all have too. So um, please sign up for that. And otherwise, thank you so much for attending everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye.